Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another video at the Pharmacist Academy! Woo! Hope you're all doing well today. For my subscribers, welcome back. If you're watching one of my videos for the first time, I do videos on pharmacy related topics. So from staying in shape while in pharmacy school, providing tips for residency interviews, board exam reviews, disease states, etc. So feel free to check out my channel, request a video or email me if you're struggling with something and you need help understanding it and I would love to help you. Okay, so today's video is focused on cephalosporins. Now for those of you who don't know, I'm doing a series of videos focused on infectious diseases and these uh, videos are great for beginners. I will include the link of some of the previous videos down below. So cephalosporins are beta-lactams, right? So they work by inhibiting the bacterial cell wall. And they do this by binding to something known as a penicillin binding protein, or you could refer to it as a transpeptidase. Now this is the enzyme that basically catalyze the building of the cell wall for the bacteria, okay? So once you mess with this, you know the bacteria cannot create a cell wall, right? So this will lead to cell death. Now, the cephalosporins are grouped into five generations. So these five generations, depending on the generation, you're going to have different coverages, right? So you may have more gram-positive versus gram-negative in one generation, or you may have better coverage for anaerobes in another generation. So it really varies. And some of these agents cover resistant organisms, so those are the ones that you really, really want to pay attention to. Now, in general, please remember that cephalosporins do not cover enterococcus. This is something that shows up a lot in exams, so please keep that in mind. A little bit about enterococcus. It's a gram-positive cocci, right? So cocci just means that it's spherical. Now, part of our normal intestinal flora contains enterococcus. Now, if there's any imbalance, right, in the gut flora, because there's millions of bacteria living there, right, and let's say they're all sharing nutrients, but if there's some kind of imbalance where the enterococcus ends up getting more nutrients compared to the other bacteria, it may become more virulent, and that's when it becomes the bad bacteria, and that's when it causes an infection, possibly. Now, there are two main species of the enterococcus family. So we have enterococcus faecalis, and then we have enterococcus facium, and they're responsible for different types of infections. Now, the reason why the cephalosporins are not active against enterococcus is simply because when they bind to that penicillin binding protein or the transpeptidase, the binding is very, it's not strong, right? It's very weak. Okay, so in that case, the beta-lactam is unable to really do what it's meant to do. Okay, so it's really due to low binding affinity to the penicillin binding protein. So now we have the first generation cephalosporins. Now the first generation cephalosporins have excellent coverage against gram-positive cocci. And it is the preferred generation when it comes to methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, which I will discuss a little bit more um, towards the end of this video. Now, they also do have gram-negative coverage. So they cover organisms such as Protease, E. coli, Klebsiella. But these agents are not really your go-to if you're thinking about gram-negative coverage, okay? So also keep in mind, as we go through the different generations of cephalosporins, the gram-negative coverage improves. So these agents are good options for uncomplicated skin, soft tissue infections, and endocarditis. Now the first generation cephalosporins, these are some of the agents in the class. Now the one that we see a lot in clinical practice is uh, cefazolin. Now we use this a lot as prophylaxis before a surgery because these agents are really good at covering gram-positive bacteria. And where do we find gram-positive bacteria? On the skin, right? And usually during a surgery, you're making an incision through the skin. So it's possible that 
you may introduce some bacteria into the blood. So they give this usually before the surgery. And also we have cephalaxin, which is a very common agent, I want to say, um, because it comes in an oral formulation. So usually if a patient is on the IV cefazolin in the hospital, when you're getting discharged, the cephalaxin is a very good option. We have these second generation cephalosporins now, so they have an improved gram-positive coxide coverage. And this is because they cover more resistant forms of these gram-positive bacteria. Now, coverage for gram-negative organisms improves, right? So as I mentioned, as you go through the generations, the gram-negative coverage improves. So the first generations are, you know, they cover Proteus, E. coli, Klebsiella. Sometimes we like to refer to it simply as PEC. Now the second generation cephalosporins, not only do they cover PEC, but they also cover Haemophilus and Neisseria, okay? And these are all gram-negative bacteria. Now, there is a subgroup of second-generation cephalosporins known as cephamycins. And the reason why we like these agents is because they have anaerobic coverage, okay? So that could be a very good option if the patient actually has an intra-abdominal infection, okay? Because that's when we really see a lot of these anaerobic organisms. So here are the agents in this class. Cefuroxime, very popular in clinical practice. And then the cefamycins are here. So these are the ones with the anaerobic coverage. So a little bit more about cefotetan, okay? Cefotetan has a possible risk of causing a disulfiram-like reaction with alcohol ingestion. And the reason why this happens is because it prevents the breakdown of the toxic metabolite of alcohol. And keep in mind that this toxic metabolite is the reason why you may experience hangover symptoms when you drink alcohol, okay? So your body normally breaks this acetaldehyde down, but cefotetan is able to actually prevent this from happening, okay? So when this happens, the patient may experience more of these uh, hangover symptoms or like even severe forms of hangover symptoms. Next, we have the third generation cephalosporins. They have good gram-positive coxide coverage, but the reason why we really like them is because they cover more resistant forms of HNPEC. Now, every time I say, oh, they cover more resistant forms of this bacteria and whatnot, all I'm trying to say is that if you had the option of choosing the third generation, right, versus the second generation, I did mention the second generation also covers HNPEC. But the third generations are obviously better, right, because they cover more resistant forms. Okay, so that's what I mean. You would still go with the third generation in that case. They also cover resistant organisms like Pseudomonas, ESBL, CRE. Okay, and I'll discuss a little bit more about some of these. Extended spectrum beta lactamases. Gram-negative bacteria that produces beta lactamases that breaks down penicillin, cephalosporins, and estreonum, right? So it's extended spectrum. Because initially, I would say very early in um, clinical practice, right? So antibiotics in general were pretty good, but there were still bacteria, especially for the penicillins, that were just resistant to penicillin because of the production of beta-lactamases. Now, over time, these bacteria have evolved, right? They've developed new resistant mechanisms, and now they're affecting the cephalosporins. Now, ESBL targets certain cephalosporins, right? Not all of them. So cefotaxime, okay, ceftriaxone, ceftazidine. Now, ceftazidine, we use it for pseudomonas coverage. So if you have like a bacteria that's all of a sudden resistant to this, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. So ESBL is mostly seen in E. coli and Klebsiella. Carbapenem resistant Enterobacteria Shea, CRE. Now, Enterobacteria Shea is a huge family of gram-negative bacteria, but some of the common ones are the ones that I've listed here, right? So E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Serratia. Now, CRE refers to Enterobacteria Shea organisms that are resistant to carbapenems. 
Now, carbapenems are also beta lactams. Now, this resistance is simply due to the production of beta lactamase enzymes that break down carbapenems. So, because of that, we call them carbapenemases. Now, CRE may also be resistant to other beta lactams, including penicillins and cephalosporins. So here are the agents in this class, ceftriaxone. The reason why we love it in clinical practice is because there's no renal adjustments, right, compared to some of these other medications in this class. And then we have ceftazidine, which has that pseudomonas coverage, okay? Please, any antibiotic that covers resistant organisms, you must know it. Okay, then we have the combination of ceftazidine with avibactam, which is a beta lactamase inhibitor. So this is called avicaz, and this covers pseudomonas, CRE, and ESBL, right? So it basically does it all. So ceftriaxone has some interesting contraindications, okay? So one being the concurrent use with calcium containing IV products and neonates. And this is because of the possible formation of ceftriaxone calcium precipitations. So even in a wide site where they have two IV bags running through the same line, they don't recommend this, right? So you want to avoid wide site administration of ceftriaxone and calcium containing solutions in any patient. And this is so significant that some studies have actually demonstrated harm in infants receiving calcium and ceftriaxone within 48 hours of each other through different IV lines, okay? So just take a second to think about that. Next, hyperbilirubin. Neonates with a lot of bilirubin in your body, okay? Let's just say it like that. Now, unconjugated or free bilirubin is normally bound to albumin in your blood, okay? And this helps reduce the toxicity that can be caused by bilirubin. So since it's bound to albumin, it's considered inactive. Now, ceftriaxone is able to displace this bilirubin bound to albumin in the body, okay? And this could cause increase in free bilirubin. And this can lead to severe encephalopathy called connectoris. And now, the reason why it's specifically neonates is because they are the ones that tend to have increased bilirubin, and so they are at a higher risk compared to adults. Fourth generation cephalosporins, okay? They have a broad gram-negative coverage. So, you know, the gram-negative coverage just keeps getting better, okay? So not only do they cover HNPEC microorganisms, they also cover CAPES, okay? Including Pseudomonas. So once again, you must know that this fourth generation cephalosporin covers pseudomonas. They have some gram-positive coxide coverage, but from the third generation going, you don't really care about the gram-positive coverage um, because it's not going to be that great, okay? So third generation is great for gram-negative and also the fourth generation. Now, the only agent in this class is cefepine. So now I wanted to talk to you guys about methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, and this will help me lead into the other generations of cephalosporins. Well, we actually have only one generation left. But anyways, Staphylococcus aureus is a type of gram-positive bacterium, and there are two main types of Staphylococcus aureus. So we have the methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, also known as MSSA. Now, this is the less virulent, you know, less aggressive, easier to manage, more friendly kind of Staphylococcus aureus. Many antibiotics that cover gram-positive bacteria will work against this organism. Beta-lactam antibiotics are the preferred class of antibiotics for these infections caused by MSSA. Now, out of all the beta-lactams, the anti-staphylococcus penicillins are the drugs of choice for MSSA. So this includes nafacillin, oxacillin, dicloxacillin. Now, the reason why it's called methicillin-sensitive staphylococcus 
is simply because methicillin was the first antibiotic from this subgroup of penicillin that showed activity against these bacteria, right, without needing a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So it was just designed like that and they were able to be effective against it. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. So this is the one that a lot of people have heard of. Now this is more virulent and it's more aggressive. It's not really that friendly compared to MSSA, okay? MRSA is all about business. It doesn't care. It's gonna infect you. It's gonna be a severe infection. If it's not managed correctly, the patient may die. MSSA acquired this mecha gene and this is what changed everything. And when this happened, the mecha gene encoded for a new transpeptidase. And this new transpeptidase had a decreased affinity for beta-lactams. So now when beta-lactams bind to this new transpeptidase, the interaction is very weak. So the beta-lactam is unable to do its job, and this is what leads to the resistance. Now, the agent ceftaroline is a fifth generation cephalosporin. Ceftaroline is able to overcome this resistance and still be effective against MRSA. So the only antibiotic from the cephalosporin class that works against MRSA infections is ceftaroline. Now we have Zerbaxa. Now I had to separate Zerbaxa because, you know, Zerbaxa feels like it's special, you know. I mean, it consists of ceftolazine and tazobactam. Tazobactam is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Now, the reason why Zerbaxa feels like it's special is because some people classify it as a fifth-generation cephalosporin, and others call it the new generation cephalosporin, okay? So I guess it's six. I don't know. But anyways, it has great activity against ESBO, and that's why we love it. And that would be the end of this video. Thank you for watching this video. Hopefully, I explained the cephalosporin class in a simplified form for you to understand. If you feel like the video was helpful, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share it with anybody that's learning infectious diseases for the first time. Trust me, I know it could get very overwhelming. Now, the next video will focus on carbapenems. Carbapenems are also beta-lactams. Make sure to connect with me on these social media platforms. Take care.